I no. won't worry about Doesn't, it. So it is this and this to advance. Right. And then I can use you also can, this. You can also do that. Yeah, yep. it doesn't seem to be picking it. That's all right. I'll just leave it. Okay, everybody. I am going to keep try and keep us on schedule. Anthony says that we're live, so we're going to just go right into our next presentation um, of the afternoon. And I am very excited to have um, uh, Sharon Wavel here. She is uh, the Associate Director of Decision Support and Reporting for the Office of Online Education at Indiana University. And we have a wonderful origin story together. Um, but um, I'm going to turn it over to Sharon right now. I'm so excited that you're here to talk with us today. Her um, presentation is Finding Common Ground, Online Education Definitions and Data Across the Big Ten. Um, we're going to talk about definitions, <laughs> common definitions. Thank you, Sharon, for being here. Hi, everybody. I um, want to make sure, can you hear me okay? Is this yes. distance all right? Uh, this is the hashtag nerd section of your conference, so um, get ready to uh, see spreadsheets and all sorts of fun things like that. Um, although I've really been um, heartened by some of the data that we've seen throughout, starting with uh, the provost yesterday morning. So it's really been a pleasure to be here. I've had a lot of fun and um, see some re really interesting conversations. And um, I thought that I would start in my presentation, I added a few things. I've had a couple people come up to me and say, you know, where are you from? And then the, they look at me and say, well, why are you here? So um, I'd like to kind of address that situation. What brought me here and why am I here to talk to you today? And I would like to first start out by saying I am SUNY born and bred. So I am, um, yes, thank you very much, SUNY Geneseo, class of 1985. So now you know how old I am. And um, my uh, my business school training, actually, my husband and I both were business school um, grads at SUNY Geneseo, and we say that that um, it was Roseanne Belanca back in the day, um, and I worked for her in the School of Business, and that business school training has taken me very, very far. Um, and I, I look back at, at that, that really was the start of everything that I've been able to do in my career from my communication skills and all my organizational skills and all that kind of good stuff. So I did go to Syracuse after that. I took some um, classes in computer science while I was at Geneseo and loved that and got my master's in computer science. And while we're talking about online education, I thought it would be important for you guys to know that back in the day, my very first program that I wrote um, at Geneseo, which started it all for me in computer science, was a COBOL program. And yes, I did it on punched cards. So. Um, yeah, I do color my hair because I, I am that old. So um, there, there we go. I just thought that would be kind of fun because now here we are in online education, but that that is where it all began. Um, so from there, though, I did do some programming for a while for um, General Electric, but then I became faculty. I found a love for teaching, and I started at SUNY Morrisville, and I taught there as a faculty member in computer information systems. Um, I then followed my husband, got a job in the administration at SUNY Cortland, and that is actually where I grew up, in the Homer Cortland area. So I uh, followed him there. I did some adjuncting at Cortland State and got a full-time job at Topkins Cortland Community College. So go TC3, anybody. I haven't seen anybody that I knew from back in the day. Um, but it was there at TC3, there was this initiative, and somebody came to me, and I was a new faculty member, and they said, hey, would you like to teach online? And of course, you say yes, right? So I'm a new fat. Yes, of course I would. And actually, I was really um, delighted to do so. And I was in a Lotus Notes training class with Alexandra Pickett and some other people in uh, spring of 2000. So she is actually my entry point into online learning. And when I saw Alexandra last um, November at the OLC conference in Orlando, I stopped her in the hallway to give her this huge hug because really that kind of all started things in online education for me. So um, kind of 20 years of experience teaching in the online space. And then from there, um, I, again, I have kind of been a trailing spouse all my life. My husband got a job in the administration at Indiana University. We, he is located at the IU Southeast campus. And so we moved there. And I followed him there and for a while did some adjunct work um, for Ivy Tech Communi Community College. I did adjuncting at Indiana University Southeast. Um, but then was kind of led into this role of decision support and reporting, a data analyst position at Indiana University Online. And there was a new Office of Online Education. My very, my very first job when I became um, a member of the staff there, there were five of us at the time in the office, um, kind of the founding members of the IU Office of Online Education. 
my first job was to implement um, this particular document that you see here. Um, this is the heading of a document. In 2012, there was a committee formed um, to kind of talk about what our definitions of online education would be at IU, and my job was to help with the implementation of that when I first got hired. The first question that we were asking were things like, how many online programs do we have across the Indiana University system, and those kinds of things. So I was really heavily involved in definitions and that kind of work from the start. Um, and then, to kind of lead into what, what I'm going to talk about here, my, our institution, Indiana University Online, the directors of, of our office have been very involved with bringing together the Big Ten Academic Alliance institutions and the online leaders of those institutions to have conversations about our common goals, our common issues and concerns and problems. It's a very collegial group. And so um, that Big Ten Academic Alliance group formed um, the data definitions working group that I became a part of. And I'll explain all of that in a bit. So what I'm here today to talk to you about is the work that we did there. Um, and so this is kind of the agenda of what I plan to talk to you in, with regard to that work. And so we'll kind of step through those things now. So, so now you know why I'm here. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I saw Phantom last night, though, so I'm good. This has been this has been remarkable. I'll come anytime you'd like. So, uh, so let's get to the why. Um, so, the Big Ten academic um, online academic leaders they get together yearly in the summer. Um, and we've been hosting them in Indianapolis, but they also do meet at other institutions, and they get together to talk about online education. Um, but um, in terms of understanding definitions, really the underlying reason why we do data definitions and why is data important, I tried to go back. I believe it's Peter Drucker is that can be attributed to the statement, what gets measured gets managed. Uh, my director, when I was first hired, said, I can't measure it. Um, if, I, if I can't measure it, I can't manage it, I can't lead it. And so that really was the driving force behind um, the, the reasons for doing data coding and getting good data. So the working group purpose, this, this data definitions working group that I served on, our purpose was really to help us gather data so that our online leaders could talk to each other about this space, to benchmark against each other, um, and to really help them in their discussions. Because, and I've kind of heard questions like this um, throughout here, and I'm sure you've heard the, these questions in your institutions, um, they, would, they would be talking to each other, and then there would be questions like this. They, How many online students do you have? And then you'd ask the question, well, what do you mean by an online student, right? And then, well, wait a minute, what's, how do you define an online class? So those kinds of questions would disrupt the flow of conversation all the time. And there were lots of places where um, there were universities using entirely different definitions for what online and hybrid meant. They would measure things across unduplicated headcounts across entire academic years versus semester data. And so all of those things kind of caused them to have problems in their discussions. So the charter of this working group was to look at the existing work that they had done in terms of online education and data, and they had tried to do some data collections in the past. They weren't super successful. Um, we were asked to look at a variety of definitions and data reporting that other um, places had in either the public reporting sphere, iPads, other, other institutions that had definitions. So we were asked to look at that. And then we were asked to establish a really an easy way for us to collect data across the Big Ten so we could answer those questions about how do we all compare in the online education space and, and what is it that we're working with and dealing with. And um, so... Um, that, that really was the, the whole purpose of this working group charter. So now let's talk a little bit about who was involved and um, what our timeline was. So Chris Foley is my director. He is currently AVP and director of the Office of Online Education at Indiana University. And we have grown from five people that founded it back in like 2012, 2013. I think right now we have maybe 30 people that work in the office. Uh, and we are what we consider an, an online support group. We support online education throughout the university. Um, Dr. Foley has been um, really pivotal in helping to organize those Big Ten meetings, and um, he is also a very data-driven guy, and he knows how much work I had done on data definitions, so he'd asked me to lead this particular working group. And we brought together other people from other universities, and they're listed here for you to see. Most of us on the working group are data analyst type people, and I think that was really critical to our success. It's people who were going to have to eventually pull the data to report back. So uh, if you leave those people out of the conversation, you end up coming up with these really interesting definitions, but in reality, 
um, they might be things that are, are difficult to collect. So this is the makeup of the group. Um, and then this is our timeline. And so you might be surprised to see that um, it's, a, it's a fairly short window to do all of those things that we were asked to do. The wheels of higher education often turn rather slowly, do they not, right? So when you're trying to move things in higher ed, because of our academic cycles and other things, it's often hard to get something done very fast. Um, that's kind of not how my director works. We take a just do it approach. Um, and so this was, he said, I would like by the summer meeting to have results. So we kind of chunked it out and said, all right, if we're gonna have results for the summer meeting, which was in July, these are the things, that, these are the milestones that we're gonna have to meet. And we're just gonna take a just do it approach. Um, and again, I think that was also part of our success. We didn't have time to mess around and debate and have conversation. We just did it and we'll, we'll do it again and we'll, we'll make revisions and, and see if we can make it better. So what did we do? What were these definitions and metrics? Um, so we, we had to establish what we were going to collect and how we were gonna collect it. And what I'd like to do right now though is make sure, there's a lot of words on this slide, but it's a bunch of people who really deserve a lot of credit. Conversations about these definitions had been happening at the national level for a little while. And many of you might be familiar with the EPSIA organization and Julie Uranus and the work that she does. Um, so she is vice president um, and, uh, of online and strategic initiatives at EPSIA. And we had had conversations after someone's conference presentation with some other people about the need for some consistent definitions in higher ed. So I actually served on her working group for about a year and we moved forward to collect a bunch of definitions. And so for my working group, when we kind of took that over at the Big Ten level, we took all of the work that Julie had done with this particular group and we used it as a starting point. And what we came up with is a definitions document. Um, and I'm gonna share that with you and, and I have given all of this stuff to Alex and, and you're welcome to it. So this is gonna take us into Excel, folks. So we'll go in and I'm gonna make sure, um, I think to be able to do that, I have to hit, I apologize, I'm gonna have to move back and forth between my presentation and my escape key isn't working. So I'm gonna end my slideshow. Um, oh, it's finally ready to use my mouse, it says, that's good. I brought a mouse up here to help me out. Uh, it looks like it took a long time for it to do that. Oh, there we go, maybe I can do it here. Um, so now I'm gonna hit escape and it's still not doing it. End slideshow. And so here is, oh, sorry. Um, so I need to share it's my- It's right there, it just takes a second. It takes a second, okay, we're good. The blank screen. So this is a spreadsheet. I just wanna be able to show you this. We're not gonna be, we're not gonna cover all this. There's cupcakes between me and you. Um, so, um, but I just wanted to give you a feel for the kinds of things that are in this spreadsheet. Basically what we did um, was we took um, this list of things that we wanted to know. We just brainstormed, what are all the measures that you want? Things like unduplicated headcounts, numbers of students in online programs, um, students taking one or more online class, students taking all of their classes online. What are the time frames that we want? And then what are the questions or the breakouts? What are the things that we really want to know? And then we, um, the grid itself basically is this big spreadsheet that says, Here's types of education and learning. We looked for every definition of some sort of distance education or e-learning or online learning. And we went and we, we organized this by where we found the institutional definitions. So things like um, the Babson Survey Research Group and the Code of Federal Regulations. Every definition that we found, we kind of outlined it into this particular grid so that we could have a way to easily reference them against each other. So types of different programs. We Every, every time we came across a different term Term for the different kinds of distance education or online programs or face-to-face -face programs. Um, some people defined all of these things. Some institutions defined one or none of them. And we just placed them in here so that we could do comparisons. Um, and as we go down through here, you'll see in these definitions as I go down, we added our own definitions. So you can see there's a Purdue definition in here. This is what Purdue or Ohio State, this is how they define distance education. And we just added all of the definitions we could find into this one big massive um, kind of working list for us to work with. So, so this was really the working document that again started with UPSIA. And we took all of these definitions and then said, how can we synthesize this and come up with our own common definition uh, of what we think online education should, should uh, be defined as. So I'm gonna go back down and find where I left off. So 
apologize for the back and forth. As promised, it's going to come up there. There we go. So um, these are the definitions that we started working with. And then these are the common definitions that we came up with. And again, we don't have time to read through all of them. One thing that we tried to make sure that we did, there were a lot of definitions that had a lot of percentages and numbers in them, like an online class or a distance education classes where 76% or more of the instruction is delivered, where the student and the instructor are separated by distance. And we tried to do a kind of a, a less strenuous definition to allow our other institutions to adapt whatever they were doing within the definition that we came up with. So our definition says any an online class is any class where they're separated by distance we use technology to bridge that gap. We did not list the technologies because five years from now that list will be out of date, right? The old definitions all list things like CD-ROMs and uh, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, kids these days don't even know what those things are. So we kind of came up with these generic definitions. So we had for online hybrid and face-to-face -face classes. And then we defined an online program um, and a hybrid program and an on-campus program. And it's really interesting because as we went through this, many of us had to kind of modify our own conceptualizations at our home campuses in order to report data under these frameworks. For example, at IU, we have an online program definition where it's 80% or more online. But I loved this definition that we came up with because what good to an online student is 80% or more, right? If I live in California, I am not coming to Indiana to take a class. Just, just that one that you decided you're not going to offer online. So I love this particular definition says it's, it's an online um, academic degree or certificate program where all of the required coursework can be completed online with exceptions for a concentrated short-term residency requirement. And we did that because we find there's a lot of programs out there where um, our Kelly School of Business, for example, has an in-residency requirement where the students come for, the summer, for, for like a two-week program in the summer. It's important for students to know that that exists, but that's not something that would prevent a student from being in the online program. There were other institutions that had similar types of experiences that they wanted for their online program students. Uh, and they still wanted to call it an online program. So I kind of liked that definition that we came up with. In terms of the metrics, again, we kind of brainstormed what are the metrics that we want and, and what are they going to look like and how are we going to break them out. And so we just, we again, looked at the things. What were the things that were most important for us to know about our online programs? And so how are we going to go to do, so we came up with a list. We came up with our definitions and how are we going to collect this data? So we'll do it the, the new way, the way the new kids do stuff. We're, we used Google Sheets and Google Forms because it was an easy way for us to share a template with someone and have them just fill in the spaces. And we thought that would be a really simple way to get the data. We wouldn't have to massage it, right? Everybody fills in their spots in the Google Sheet, and then we would just analyze the data. Um, I will say, um, with Google Sheets, we had people that would upload their version of the Google Sheet, the whole thing, and wipe out everyone else's data. It was really fun. But Google Sheets gives you vision, rev revision history, right? So we could go to old versions and recover. So we've learned a few things. I don't think we're going to do that exactly the same way. I think we're going to give everyone their own sheet next time and do that work and then compile it. So, um, so learn that. Google Forms is super great, except if you go back and you don't do the whole thing all at once, it doesn't save your work. So we learned that too. So so we tried to do it the simplest way, the most economical way. Again, we were under great deadline. Um, but for the most part, it, it kind of worked. Um, and so we did let the Big Ten um, leaders look at this and review it a little bit, but we didn't get a lot of feedback. Essentially, they looked and said, this looks great. Just go ahead and do it. So we did. Um, we gave everybody instructions, and the instructions said, please read the instructions uh, on the sheet and make sure you follow them. And then we still had people upload and wipe out everybody else's data. It was great. Um, so they were given their rows. And then we also had a survey. We collected some qualitative information about the online support units that are at each Big, big Ten institution, and that has yielded some really interesting results. And I'm going to share a little bit of those results with you today. Um, I should show you probably the data collection sheet. So here we go for fun grins. Um, I don't know how much I'll demonstrate to you here. Maybe can I bring up? It won't let me. Um, well, I might as well show you. So it'll be relevant later. So I will bring up um, the data collection sheet. 
Uh, yes, this is the data collection sheet. So here's my instructions over here, right? And big saying, don't, please don't upload the whole thing, but they did anyway. Um, we, in the instructions, we said, here's what we're supposed to do. And then we put our definitions right in here. And then on each tab, this is everything that we want you to tell us about your university at this level for this particular metric, for these particular terms. And we had some formulas in here to add some stuff up. So it was a, it was a worksheet just like this. And, and the point was that you would then filter to your own institution fill in the blanks, and then we were going to collate all of this. So we had a page for courses and for students and for programs. And again, we designed this with our analysts in mind, knowing what's the way that we would typically pull data and copy and paste into here so that the analyst would have as easy a time as possible. So um, that's that. And then um, I also did want to show you our survey, which is in this folder, and I might as well show it to you directly from here rather than going back and forth. Um, this is what the support unit survey looked like. Again, we did it in Google Forms, but this is a PDF version. Um, it was just a bunch of questions that asked about your support unit and, you know, where is it housed? What's the name of your support unit? Um, do you have a responsibility system-wide or just for your flagship? Um, what kinds of services do you provide? And those kinds of things. There's budget and revenue information in here, too, and I'll give you some aggregated information about that as well. So um, just some interesting stuff there. So let me go back to the presentation. And we were here and here. And so now uh, we're going to go down to our data analysis. So now what did we find out and what can we see? And I'm going to check. How am I on time? Am I good? Uh, you're good. Okay. Um, so in our data analysis, so we are the Big Ten, and yes, I'm in data analytics, but we can't count in the Big Ten. If you've ever counted, there's not 10 Big Tens, but it's still the Big Ten because they got a cool logo and it sounds good. Big 11 just doesn't, and Big 15 really doesn't have any ring to it. So um, 10 of the 15 institutions that we sent this to responded. Not bad for the very first time we're going to do this. And what we found is some institutions still just really have a difficult time um, trying to give us this kind of data. And so these are the institutions that did responded. Some of the institutions responded and only filled in small amounts of the data. We took whatever we could get, essentially. Um, the first thing that we had to do, I did show you that data collection sheet, and the first thing that we had to do when we got this, this is easy for people to submit their data with. This is not easy in an Excel spreadsheet to do pivot tables and things like that with because it's got longitudinal data across the columns. So that's nerd talk for what we had to do is flatten this spreadsheet so it was in a format that was more like what we would pull out of our, our census snapshot data so we could analyze it using pivot tables and that kind of good stuff. And so we put it into a format that looked like this. And I have to give a shout out to, I have an analyst, Chelsea Dietrich, who works for me. And uh, if she ever watches this, she'll be tickled that I mentioned her. Um, we use a tool called Alteryx, which is a special data prep and blending tool that allows us to automate these really cool workflows and do this in about, uh, I can do it in about 10 seconds. I can take this massive spreadsheet and flatten it because she's built the workflow out. So every time we do this data collection, I'm not going to spend three days flattening the file so I can analyze it. I spend about five minutes, which is really super cool. So we developed that first, and here we go. This is, this is uh, the picture of what the Big Ten looks like in terms of online education. Again, for those that reported, and what you're seeing here, this is the number of programs they offer. And the blue line is the, their online programs, and then um, the crimson line-ish, whatever that is. Actually, that's, I'm sorry, these are university-branded colors. I switched this to an IU template. That's midnight and crimson, if you're, if you're wondering. Um, so you can see IU, actually not ba a bad player there with, um, we were reporting 118 online programs. That's different than our official number because it's the modified definition. So we did go through and modify what we do to fit the common definitions um, that we that we use. And But you can see the big player here is that Penn State World Campus, right? So is that World Campus Global? Yes, Penn, I think that's their name. Um, so, uh, so there's what this space looks like. This is the number of graduates that was provided. One other flaw in our data collection that we plan to um, kind of do a better job with. The fact that there are no graduates here for Nebraska and Minnesota is, is not saying that they had no graduates. They just didn't submit this data to us. So we didn't do a good job in the data collection with did you not have any or were you unable to report. So we got to do a better job with that in the future. But this kind of gives you a picture of what's going on in that space. This is online program enrollment. And I'm going to get a, a drink of water here. Or I've got this Ohio River.
What's important here are not the numbers. So I don't want you going running back and saying all these numbers. This is stuff that you could mine for on their public websites and things. What is important in the next couple of slides I'm going to show you is anywhere there's a decline, I've put it in red, and or crimson, excuse me, and any time that it's either um, flat or an, an increase, it's shown in, in the midnight or the blue color. So you can see your online program enrollments across the board for everybody that reported. Are they going up or down? They're going up, right? So they're all in the blue. So we're looking, this is the change from fall 17 to fall 18 in online program enrollments across their systems. For the most part, Purdue only, Purdue is not Purdue Global here. Purdue is just their flagship institution. They were not able to give us any system-wide data, which also is just a big concern with um, what we're doing with our data collection. Um, so everyone's showing a percentage increase that's that's relatively decent when you look across these. You have to keep in mind some of the enrollments are fairly low to begin with, so a 10% increase from a low enrollment is a different number than 10% and a relatively high number. When we look at credit hours, that's that's actually a kind of a better measure of what's really happening in the online space. Um, what this is is a comparison of online credit hours to face-to-face -face credit hours, and then online is a percent of total, and we're going from fall 17 to fall 18. And again, what I've done here, any increases are in blue. So when we, when we look at the percent change here in this column, you're not seeing my pointer, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, let me try something. Can you see my pointer now? No. No. Well, okay. Well, oh, I was drawing something. Um, let me see. Laser pointer. Oh, I think I found it, folks. Oh, you can see it now. Thank you. I got it. Um, so here we go. In this column here, you're seeing the percent change in credit hours, and these are all blue. So online credit hours, for the most part, for everybody are going up, and in some cases significantly. In the gray columns here, those are face-to-face -face hours. What's happening with face-to-face -face hours? Everybody, this is the, this is a similar story. Isn't this neat to see this similar story happening across all these Big Ten institutions? And then online as a percent of total is provided over here. I like to look at that a little bit differently. So we did this with it, and this is online credit hours and just with total hours listed. And then we did online hours as a percentage of all of their credit hours. And so you can see for many of these big institutions, um, we're at about 12 percent of their total credit hours being offered through online classes. One interesting thing, though, that happens in here, does anybody, and I know it's kind of small maybe if you're in the cheap seats, but do you notice anything about one particular institution that changes when we go from the, the total credit hour view to the percentage of all credit hour views? Iowa, isn't that really interesting? So they're really small but mighty, right? So little Iowa here with relatively small numbers of credits, but when you look as a percentage of their total institution offerings, they're up with the big dogs, right? So it, this was really interesting when we started to play with this, these particular numbers. So this next number is um, undergraduate students taking one or more online class, another really common metric that we see used when we talk about online education. Again, these first columns here are students taking one or more online class, and what we see here are all these blue increases, right, across the, across the board. And in some cases, you know, the Purdue flagship institution is showing a 26% increase from fall to fall in the number of students taking an online class. Um, so, and then in the gray columns here, this is the total university headcount, what's happening in total headcounts, right? And that, again, that's a common story. And then, so then we see this percentage of a total, and we go over here and we flip it and say, I want to look at this more visually. And again, we can see these um, one or more online class percentages. We have... Um, Iowa kind of down here again, but the really neat thing, the observation I make when I look at this particular data, when I look at things as a percent of total, nationwide, what's the percentage in general of students taking online classes? What's that percentage number? 30%, it's about a third, about a third of all students, and look where most of our institutions landed right here in the data. So again, just kind of co confirming those national trends um, among the Big Ten institutions, which I think um, was a really interesting thing to do. Um, this is, I didn't give the actual credit hours or the actual numbers in a chart. In the interest of time, we can't look at all of my data. We've got tons more. I could stay here all afternoon, but um, you guys have things to do. This is students taking all of their classes online, and those numbers are, of course, much lower than they are for the students taking one or more. Um, but you can see what this looks like in this particular space. Um, again, but Penn State tends to stay on top here, but we know um, their, their world campus stuff uh, they're, they're, they're big in that space regardless. 
So I'm going to move a little bit now to talk about the online support unit survey. So again, this is asking about this, the, the unit at your institution that supports online education. And so we asked the leaders of those online support units to fill out this survey. And so now I'll give you a picture of what those particular units look like. So, and now in this, we sent this out, and we only had eight institutions um, respond to this. I'm not going to say anything about the fact that 10 of 15, where we sent it to the data analysts, got it done. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we have eight, but eight was good enough for us to at least look at the data. And of those eight that responded, um, we asked the question, is your Big Ten um, um, institution, are you part of a system or not? And seven of the eight that responded were part of a system. And um, six of those institutions have three to seven campuses. Uh, one institution had 25 campuses, and one was reporting as the flagship only, or was only a flagship campus. They didn't have any multiple campuses that they were responsible for. All, um, all of this, the people that were part of a system, those online support units had responsibilities across their entire system. Um, in terms of the institutions reporting, um, five of them were housed in the provost office. That's where they reported to. And then the other, institu uh, other institutions were located in IT, one in continuing education, and one had a separate vice president that they reported to. All seven, or seven of eight, had a governance or advisor, advisory committee. Um, and for those institutions, all eight that reported said their scope included managing online programs. Six of them said they were responsible for instructional design and other things for the courses, online courses offered to students in their online programs. And then four of them were responsible also for online courses, even for non-online students, so for their campus-based programs. And these are the major services. So we gave them a checklist and said, what are the things that you're responsible for in your online support unit? And so um, you can see the very top one is state authorization and compliance. Of course, that's a really big one. I think in many cases, that's why the online support unit even came into being, because um, we have to do this. It's, a, it's very important. Um, but then you've got um, vendor management, um, things like marketing and recruitment um, and enrollment and market research, instructional design, and so on and so forth. So again, just looking at the wide range of things that these online support students do, what's the story here? Our online support, student, our, our, our online support units do a really wide variety and large list of things to support online programs at our institutions. Um, in terms of size, so um, th this was really interesting to look at. And of course, a lot of this data, I can't provide a lot of this, but this is just a nice summary. Um, but the support units, so these institutions, um, one of the institutions had between one and five FTE. Five of them had 25 to 50 people um, in their online support unit. And then there was one with 100 to 125. I'll let you guess. Um, where that one is. So, and we tried to give, you know, we didn't want to be just too specific and just doling out all of this information. Their budgets ranged from three and a half million to 10 million. And again, that's for the online support unit. And that was the range um, from six of the respondents. The other two didn't give us that information. Um, the average revenue reported for online courses was 107 million. And then their average um, online program revenue as reported was 41 million. So, just some interesting little tidbits. Um, so in, just an interesting thing to look at and then to be able, again, it's that benchmarking, right? We want to be able to talk to each other and benchmark so that we understand our common concerns and can learn lessons from each other. So so we did all of this stuff. Now what? what what's important in all of this? And um, you know, what did we learn from it? So um, really, one of the first things is I, I, I realize we're, at Indiana University, there was a, a focus from the very start on data. And so we established our data capabilities right up front. And um, really, we're able to report a lot of online education data that other institutions just can't. So I feel really blessed that we're able to do that. Um, but not everybody can do that. It's not easy to do. And um, the flagship versus system reporting is also really po problematic. There are questions out there saying, well, maybe we should have everyone report their system data. But I'd also like to know what online looks like just at their flagship institutions. I know for us at Indiana University, that's really problematic. Our flagship institution is a very traditional 
um, brick and mortar, I should say limestone, right? Those are those beautiful limestone buildings. Our students go to Bloomington because they want to be at the Bloomington campus. We don't have a lot of undergraduate online education there. There is some, and it's growing. Um, but right now, if we were to report that, there would not be very much to report. So it's those kinds of questions and issues about the system flagship thing that are really interesting to think about. Um, I talked to you already about the technical glitches using Google Sheets and Google Forms and that we've kind of learned from, and we are going to do this data collection again this summer um, to try to get, we're going to try to bring more people on board um, to get those institutions that couldn't report, maybe help them report. Um, and, and really, we've used this group among us to, as a forum for d discussing the common issues we have in data analytics. We all got to complain um, together about U.S. News and World Report, right? So, and NC Sarah and all those other things that are really difficult, challenging things that we need to report on, we can exchange ideas and talk about what's your institution doing um, and, and get ideas from each other on how best um, to manage and report our online education data. So if we can help another institution talk about their data coding and their data reporting responsibilities and, and how they might um, improve in that space, I think that's a common or actually a really important way that we can leverage that Big Ten Academic Alliance group um, to help us all become better at this. So there are a few discussions about data use and privacy. You know, when you ask people for this level of data, um, we, we collected a lot of other data that you're not seeing here, and we're very careful with how we share that data out. And so some people were asking, you know, why do you need all of this, and, and why do you want it? And um, I think one other big advantage for me was when going through this particular exercise, it, it really helped me clarify our own institutional definitions. I have made some adjustments, and I have some planned adjustments that I'd like to make to our institutional definitions. Um, not touching the underlying coding, but perhaps how we interpret the data, um, but just some things to think about. It, it is an evolving field, and the definitions that we came up with now uh, seven or eight years ago, things have evolved. Um, one thing that's kind of driving us a little crazy is the use of online education versus distance education. Does that bother anybody? Like, we use those two terms interchangeably now, but it used to be there was like a distinction about it, that distance meant everything and online was just that asynchronous stuff. And no one makes that distinction anymore. So it's those kinds of terminology things that I think if we all start to use the same language, we'll just be in a better position to understand each other. Online education tends to roll off the tongue just a little bit easier. Uh, but everyone says DE all the time. So I don't know how we're going to do those kinds of things. So um, those are some things that we've kind of learned along the way and things that have kind of helped us out. Uh, looking ahead, we do want to do another data collection this summer. So again, now we'll start to be able to collect some longitudinal data, which would be really fun to see. Um, we'd like to increase our response rates. We've been asked for a how-to video, kind of walking through the spreadsheet and what, how we want you to respond. Um, and then I also... My access to the analysts on the campus was always through the online leaders, and sometimes that telephone game um, is, isn't all that fun. So we're hoping maybe to get direct access to the analysts who are actually doing the work to help them um, with this particular project. And I have had people reaching out about um, you know doing this on a national scale or helping with national definitions. So we have continued conversations going on with Julie um, Uranus uh, in terms of sharing what we came up with. It seemed to kind of work okay when we did it. So um, thinking about expanding the scope uh, we, we did this presentation at UPSIA, and there were some institutions that came up and said, you know what, it would be really, could we report, even though we're not in the Big Ten? We'll just make the Big Ten bigger. Well, I no, I can't do that, can I? I, I have no authority to do that. Um, we'll just, we'll call it this um, distance education, online education data working group, and we'll, and we'll, we'll expand the scope or something. Um, and it would be really interesting, I think, um, Really, this, this data could provide us with some really rich information um, if we could expand um, the research topics. And I know there's a lot of important research being done on how online classes help students meet their educational goals. Um, a lot of that's been done at the online class taking level in terms of retention and degree completion level. I think there needs to be more done for online program students specifically, those who are taking all of their classes online. I think they're kind of different than those who are taking online as part of their on-campus programs. Um, so I, I think there's just a lot of um, really ripe areas um, for research that we could kind of lead into. So um, with that, before I open us up to kind of talk about this work and kind of questions and that kind of stuff, I do want to make sure I acknowledge the people who make this work, work possible because 
it is not me alone. My director, Chris Foley, he gives me the, the ability to do things like come here and, and talk with you about this. And really, this particular working group was a concept out of that Big Ten um, Academic Alliance leadership group. Those online leaders knew that there was a need for this. So I'm grateful to them for the concept for this. And then my working group folks, they've been terrific. Um, it's really, really fun to establish colleagues across universities. I know in the end, we all are competing for students, but as we know, students tend to like to go to institutions that are kind of close to where they're at. So I still think there's there's a lot of room for us um, to, to work collegi collegially together so that we can kind of learn from each other um, and share best practices and do those kinds of things. Um, and, and meeting colleagues from across other institutions has been really fun. And they were incredibly um, great to work with. And then my decision support team, um, like I said, Chelsea's the one who helped me so that I don't have to spend hours flattening those spreadsheets and analyzing them. She has a whole workflow built that just kind of magically produces this for me. And then the rest of my team, they're really busy working while I'm here um, having fun with you folks in New York City. And so I just want to make sure that they know I appreciate them as well. So um, that's the stuff that I wanted to share with you. And I know it's kind of quick, but... Um, we, we have cupcakes out there and stuff, too. So we have to make sure that we have time for that. So um, any questions that you have, any discussion, my contact information is up there if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out later on um, or tweet an embarrassing picture of me up here. I don't know. Whatever you'd like to do, you're welcome to do that. So any questions? Or you just want to go get cupcakes? Yeah. I, hello, is this on? Yes. Um, just one question, Sharon. Um, you had had a slide up there with the – the total revenues, those were averages across the six schools, correct? That is correct. I took what everybody gave us and I averaged it together. Okay. That, Thank that you. was the average total revenue that was reported. Yep. Okay. Thank you. No, I've, I've nerded you out for the day. No other. Any no other qu questions I, from the group? Ask a nerdy question. Okay. I love nerdy questions. <laughs> Um, for your online program enrollment, was that only for students who were participating in the program online or only for the online version of the program? Like, how did you get to that That definition? is supposed to be students who are enrolled in, in an online program. So they have deliberately enrolled in an online program and are, are taking an online program. So this goes back to our conversation about tracking the right. online program different than the on-campus program. Okay. Well, cool. and I think we talked about, too, you can have students enrolled in an online program and then they end up taking all their classes on campus. Mm -hmm. And that we do have programs at um, IU, for example, um, our, our NTBSN program, there is an online version and an on-campus version, and they very carefully make sure students are only allowed to switch from one to the other a certain number of times. They have very specific accreditation requirements, um, and so they actually don't allow their students to take on-campus classes if they're in the online version and vice versa. They control that. That um, That's not necessarily the case for all of our programs, and I don't think that's true for many of the Big Ten institutions. So then we'll have students who are in an on-campus program, and they're taking all of their classes online in a given semester. And so what we do is we also try to look at those students and say, okay, what program are they in? And if we find a bunch of students who are able to do that, maybe that's a program that we need to make sure goes through an approval process. Or maybe that student just had a, a problem that particular semester where online was the solution to let them take care of an ailing parent or go um, visit a family member who really needed to and then still continue with their degree because they could get some classes online that term. So it, it's messy. It's, it's not a really clean count. Um, and the data is also only as good as what we pull out is only as good as the data coding underneath. So, so maybe shout out to all of our registrars on every single campus who do that stuff every single day and make sure students are in the right plans and that courses are coded with the right instruction modes so that we all know what's going on. So there's a lot of people who work hard so that we can do this fun work. So no other nerds in the audience. I mean, I can keep online? going. Any? <laughs> <laughs> what Aaron, was the questions online? Okay. No. Anyone else? Was there any follow-up with the campuses that didn't submit data or, or the campuses that completed incomplete data to see where the challenges were? We did a couple follow-ups. Um, there were a couple cases where the, the campus reported the number of um, students taking all of their classes online was larger than the number of students taking one or more online class. And when we thought about it, that was like, that doesn't make sense. So there was just confusion again over what we were asking. So we did do, we tried to do some data cleanup and follow up. The time frame was so tight, it was hard to do it before we did our reporting. Um, but now we will reach out individually to some campuses to do that. Yeah. 
Well, I thank you very much, as if there's nothing else. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you. Yes. Glad I finally figured out how to use the whole pointer thing. I don't. This is Adobe. We don't need okay. that. And I'll leave these files here if Great. you want to see those definition yeah. files here. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. She's going to be here for the rest of the conference. If anyone wants to chat with her uh, um, any more about all this nerdy stuff, <laughs> um, we're going to have a break now. Fifteen minutes. I. I think I saw some lovely pretzels out there. Um, so we're coming back in 15 minutes to do our Effective Practice Awards presentations and to recognize our um, online teaching ambassadors. So please go get a snack and come back in 15 minutes. Thank you. Sorry?